Welcome to the second part about dense text representations. I'm Nitz Reimers, I work for Hugging Face, and I'm the author of Sentence Transformers. Today, we cover basic training methods. So in the first part, we learned about the background on dense text representations. Now in the second part, we learn how to train them, what loss functions are available, and how we can improve the quality of the dense vector spaces. The most simple baseline is average word embeddings in a sentence. So you take your, you, you take your sentence, you take your document, you tokenize it, and then you take some word embeddings, for example, from word to vec or from glove. You map every word to this word embedding, and then you compute the mean over all these word embeddings. An improvement compared to simply adding all the words is to weight the word embeddings by TF-IDF so that content words contribute more than stock words. This is a fast and simple method, and it can also be used with custom trained word embeddings. A disadvantage of this approach is that it does not cover the word order, so it does not preserve the word order, and it can also not deal with um, ambiguous words. So the first idea is like, can we do this also with contextualized word embeddings? So for example, with the contextualized word embeddings we get from BERT, the simple answer is no. So if we simply average a contextualized word embeddings we get from BERT and we compare to averaging word embeddings from word to vec, we see that it's actually performing worse. So uh, we spend a lot of energy computing these contextualized word embeddings and then it, at the end it performs worse. However, there are different training methods how you can improve the quality. So if you look at unsupervised methods, the best approach achieves like a score around 60 evaluated on 14 data sets. If you take some NLI data, uh, you can improve even further to 62. And if you increase your training data, you get a significant improvement to 68. So out of the box, BERT performs badly. And what you need is some labeled or structured data. Uh, in this talk, I will uh, address these, which type of labeled or structured data you need and how you can tune, fine tune BERT to give you nice dense representations for text. The most simple setup to train um, to, to train or to use BERT to train sentence embeddings uh, is using the cosine similarity loss. That's also the original loss I presented in my papers on sentence BERT. So you have to, to input text. You have to, to input text, how to learn C and how to learn C++. You pass them through a BERT network. BERT gives you contextualized word embeddings for all the words in the input. And then you have some pooling operation. So here you get like a variable sized number of contextualized word embeddings, but what you want is a fixed sized, um, fixed sized vector. So different pooling operation are possible. For example, you just use the CLS token of BERT, or what I prefer is to use the mean pooling of all the contextualized word embeddings. Then you can compare these two embeddings using cosine similarity. As mentioned, if you just do this, you get rather poor performances. So what you need is some gold label. So you have this pair, how to learn C and how to learn C++. And some human annotator said, OK, this has a label of 0 0.9. And then you can compute the loss, the MSE loss between the GOAT label of 0.9 and the cosine similarity of 0.4. And you can do backpropagation. There are two ways how you can use BERT. So sometimes people use independent BERT networks here, but usually it's, it makes sense to share the weights. So this BERT network, the first BERT network, and the second BERT network are exactly the same. It's the same BERT network where you pass your text through. There are various loss functions available in sentence transformers, how you can train your vector space models. So there's, as mentioned, the cosine similarity loss, then there's like some softmax loss, some constructive and online constructive loss, triplet loss, different batch triplet losses, uh, mega batch margin loss and multiple negative ranking loss and several more. In this talk, I will just cover the most important loss functions. A simple real loss or an also quite old loss is a constructive loss. Here you have positive pairs and you have negative pairs. Positive pairs, you want to pull them together in the vector space and negative pairs, you want to push them away in the vector space. 
So here it's visualized with um, images. So you have two images of the same player. You embed them in the vector space and you want them to be pushed close in the vector space so that they are at the same position in the vector space. If you have two images of different players, of different persons, you embed them in the vector space and you want to push them away in the vector space. The challenge with this loss is um, how to balance like how many positive pairs, how many negative pairs do I have? And also the, the uh, loss has issues because um, it can collapse. So, so if it can happen that all the images are pulled together, uh, which are already quite close. And it can also happen that images are pushed away, which are already quite far away. And it can also be happen that images are pushed out of the cluster. So the loss is quite simple, but it does not work that well. An improvement is triplet loss. So in triplet loss, as the name says, you, you work with triplets. You have some anchor, you have a positive, and you have a negative. Again, visualized with images, you have here Barack Obama, and then you have a different image of Obama, and then you have an image of Macron. And you embed them in the vector spaces, and then you want these two images close in the vector space and the anchor and negative far away in the vector space. Now the triplet loss works a bit different than the constructive loss. It looks like, is, it, it looks, is the negative closer to the positive? Yeah, is the negative closer to the anchor than the positive is to the anchor? So if the negative is closer to the anchor, it will push the negative further away and it will pu pull the positive closer to the anchor. And in triplet loss, there's some margin. So, so if we say the negative is far away enough, so, so, so it's already really far away. So this image of Macron is already really far away in the vector space, then we do not do any updates. Um, however, if it's below a certain margin, then we will do an update. And this results in like three different spaces. So here we have the anchor, and uh, here we have the positive, if the negative is somewhere here in this red area, we call it hard negative because it's closer to the anchor than the distance between anchor and positive. If it's somewhere here in the orange, we say it's semi-hard negatives because it's further away as the, than the positive, but still not really far away. And when it's outside here, um, it's an easy negative um, because it's already really far away from the positive and it's easy to distinguish between anchor and positive and anchor and negative. To work well, this requires good triplets. And this is not always easy to get like, and it can be like really compute inefficient to find these triplets. So when you learn vector spaces, um, you have to optimize the global and the local structure of vector spaces. So under the global structure, you understand the relationship to random sentences or to random images. And under the local structure, you understand the relationship of two similar sentences. And usually it, it makes sense that the last function optimizes the local and the global structure. So for example, if you have constructive loss or triplet loss, they might only optimize the local structure. So uh, it might happen that from the triplets you, you um, you push away the negatives, but they are overlap between uh, the data sets. So for example, in, in, on the left side here, we see that the different clusters on different topics, they overlap and the distance between the different blues might be suitable, but overall, if you mix the classes, they do not work quite well. In contrast, if you have a good global structure, you have good, good clusters. So, so here you have, for example, in, when you do clustering of questions like uh, how to learn programming, questions about traveling, questions about online gaming, and they're quite nicely separated. And within the structure, within the cluster, you have also meaningful uh, distances. So here you have like two different programming questions, how to learn C and how to learn C++. They should be closer in the vector space than how to learn C and how to learn Python, for example. To overcome the issue with this global structure and local structure and how to find negatives, um, people have proposed batch hard triplet loss. So it, with batch hard triplet loss, you have a batch uh, with multiple examples for each class. 
So here, for example, you have like a, a batch where you have multiple examples of blue points and multiple examples of yellow points. So for images, this could be like blue could be Obama and uh, yellow could be images of Angela Merkel. So the loss takes one element, one random element as an anchor. And then it looks like, so, so one image of Obama as an anchor, then looks like what is the closest image of Angela Merkel in vector space? And what is the furthest away Obama image in the vector space? And use them as a triplet. So you take this as the anchor, this as the positive, and this as a negative. And this automatically takes the hardest possible uh, triplet in your batch. And so this, this is quite nice because then you don't have to create these triplets uh, by hand, but they are automatically generated when you train. A loss that is quite successful for text and also images is multiple negative ranking loss. So for multiple negative ranking loss, what you need is you have some positive pairs, anchor and positive. Um, it's, it's quite flexible what you can use there. So for example, in, in question answering, you can take a search query and the answer passage. In duplicate question mining, you can use a question and some other question which was marked as duplicate. And or you can use citations from scientific papers and you take the paper and the cited paper. What you want is that the anchor and the positive are close in the vector space. So the query and the answer passage is close in vector space. And it should be far away for all the other, um, other passages, or the, uh, all the other positives in the vector space. So the idea is that it's unlikely if you take two randomly selected questions that are, they are similar, so or sentences. So, so if you have a query, how many people live in Darmstadt, and you have the answer to that, and you take some other random passage from Wikipedia, it's quite unlikely that it also provides the answer to your question. So what we want as vector space is to, here we have the anchor. We want to pull the P1 close to the anchor and push all the other P's far away in the vector space. And that's also why it's sometimes called training with in-batch negatives. So how do you compute this loss? The computation is quite easy. You compute it with cross entropy. So you have some A given, some anchor given, and you want to find like what's the correct answer. Is it P1, P2, or P3? So you compute the score between A1 and P1, between A1 and P3, and between A1 and P, uh, P2 and P3. And then you simply do cross entropy loss with the gold label. Uh, 100. Zero, zero. So you know this is the correct answer we want to have. We want this to be have a high score, high cosine similarity, and we want this to have no cosine similarity. And you do simply training this cross entropy. It's quite easy to improve the quality with this training objective. Um, so you simply train with larger batch sizes because this makes the task more difficult and you get better results. So for example, if you have a query like how many people live in, in Darmstadt and there are like 10 passages, one passage is providing the answer, the correct answer, it's quite easy to identify this one passage. However, if there are like 1,000 passages or 10,000 passages and I have to choose like, okay, which one of these 1,000 passages is providing the correct answer, this is a lot harder. And as we see, with increasing batch size, the performance significantly goes up. Um, so here we see the performance on, a, uh, on MS Marco, which is a well-known data set for semantic search uh, based on search query from Bing. Another strategy we see here is that you can use hard negatives. So here the, the black line is without hard negatives and the red line is with hard negatives. So we get a significant performance increase by using hard negatives. So what are hard negatives? So instead of having pairs, positive pairs, we add hard negative pairs. So we have triplets, A1, P1, and N1, negative one, anchor two, positive two, and negative two. And N1, uh, Ni should be similar to P1, Pi, but not match with Ai. So a bad example would be, for example, you have the anchor, how many people live in London? 
the positive passage is around 9 million people live in London. And a bad negative passage would be London has a population of 9 million people. Um, we as human knows, okay, this, this is not really a negative one. Good example would be as a negative, around 1 million people live in Birmingham, second to London. Still talking about London, it still talks about how many people live in different cities in UK, but it does not provide the answer to this query. And training is really simple with when with this triplets. So as before, you have your vector space, you encode all the positives in the vector space, you encode all the negatives in a batch in the vector space. And now you want to pull P1 close to A1, you want to pull the positive close to the anchor, and you want to push all the other positives and all the negatives, including the hard negative N1, far away in the vector space. And here you see that N1 is closer to the anchor than P1, so this would be a bad situation. So you want to have this pushed away, further away than the positive. So how do we find hard negatives? The quality of the hard negatives significantly improves the performance, but finding good hard negatives is not easy. So this is like really a lot of science and experiments go into uh, finding these hard negatives. One strategy is to exploit some structure in your data. So for example, when you work on citation graphs on publications, you can take the title at the anchor, the cited paper as the positive, and a paper cited by the cited paper as your hard negative. So it will be still similar to the cited paper, but should not be as close to your original paper. When question answering, you can take the question, you can take the answer which got the most stars on, for example, Stack Overflow, and then you take another answer on the same question, but which has like significantly less stars. A different strategy is to mine hard negatives. A simple approach is to use BM25 flexible overlap uh, to find the top 100 most similar text to your anchor or your positive, and then you select one of these randomly. <clears throat> However, the issue with BM25 negatives is that these are not necessarily good hard negatives. So for example, here we have our query, then we have some positive documents, uh, which are close in the vector space. And then here in the orange, we see these are like BM25 negatives. And sometimes they are really simple, even set they have a lexical overlap, they can be really far away in the vector space. So what we want is to find these blue one, the dense representation negatives, which are close to the query, close to, re to the relevant in the vector space. How to do that? First, you have to understand the difference between bi-encoder and cross-encoder. There are two different ways how you can encode, uh, how you can compare, uh, compute the similarity between two texts. One is using bi-encoders. So you have your two texts, sentence A and sentence B. You create an embedding U and V, and then you compute the cosine similarity between these two embeddings. And this gives you a similarity um, on the two texts. Different approach is to use cross encoder. So here you input simultaneously both text, text A and text B to BERT. BERT now can do cross attention between the two inputs. And then on top of the CLS token of BERT, you add a linear layer, which maps from 768 to one dimension, which outputs you want a score between zero and one. So the big difference is that cross encoders get a lot better uh, performances, a lot higher uh, accuracies on different tasks. And because they can look at both inputs at the same time, and they can perform cross attention between the two inputs. Another different important difference is that um, cross encoder also work nicer with less data. So here we see if when we reduce the training data for bi encoder, the performance drops drastically. However, when we have um, Little training data for the crossing owner, we still get quite good performances. So how can we use this cross encoder to find hard negatives? So we do this in a multi-step approach. We have some training data. We use the training data to train some bi encoder, and we use the training data to train some cross encoder. Then with the bi encoder, we clo mine close points with the bi encoder. So, so we take the training 
the training query. We look in the vector space which points are close, and we um, extract them from the vector space. However, this can extract a lot of false negatives. So, so for example, um, passages like this. Um, so, so maybe this point is like really close in vector space. London has a population of nine million people. This would be like a bad negative example because it provides the answer to the question, but the model would punish this answer. So what we do is we take the more powerful cross encoder and we check the similarity between the query, the training query and every mind uh, passage. And we only keep the passages, the query passage pairs where we where the cross encoder says no this this does not provide this does not answer the question and there we can be certain that these are really good hard negatives so the question is like how big is the improvement um, as before um, it's measured on the ms macro data set which has a training set of like of around 500,000 search queries from bing and various answers from the internet so if we train with random negatives, we get an MMR at 10 of 26. We can improve this performance by adding BM25 negatives. So we get a nice improvement by nearly four points. If we now mine hard negatives and we do not do the denoising with the cross encoder, we actually see a performance drop. So it drops to 26. However, when we do the denoising with the cross encoder, we get a significant improvement to 36. And you can really notice this, um, the quality as a human. So, so it's not just an academic number where you see, okay, we get some few points improvement, but actually when you apply these systems on large data sets and you do search, you see a lot, quite big difference between uh, these different numbers. So conclusion for the basic training uh, session. So there are many different loss functions available. Which loss function is suitable for you depends a little bit on your task and what type of label data you have. In many cases, the multiple negative ranking loss works well. Um, there you just need pairs, positive pairs where you have an anchor and some positive text which you want to have, want to have close in the vector space. Adding hard negatives improves the performance for search um, by quite far. However, it degrades the performance for clustering. So as before, there's like no gold solution, which always works. So for search, hard negatives are great. For clustering, hard negatives are harmful. Finding hard negatives is not trivial. Um, so often people use like multi-step approach where they use a powerful cross encoder to mine these. And they often do it over multiple iterations to get like hard negatives um, in each of these steps.